Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for taking um, the time to join us with our expert here, Dr. Nir um, Barzilai, who is located in New York. Um, we're going to have him speak to us for a little bit just about um, his background and what his background is in um, the basic and biomedical sciences, as well as clinical medicine as it relates to aging and the research that he's been doing. Um, and then we'll open it up to have conversations. And so we encourage everybody to turn their microphones on and their cameras on if you're able to, so that way we can have a um, discussion with him and you can ask him any questions that you may have. So um, Dr. Barzilai. Uh, terrific, uh, good morning, everyone. I wanna thank first Samantha and, and tech to, uh, thank the National Academy of Medicine for this initiative. Look, we're all catching a wave uh, Ping Hao, maybe you should put your background there, but we're catching of a wave. Uh, we discovered that just as much as climate change and, and epidemics and stuff is important, it's also very important to change the face of aging. And, and the basic message to you is that aging has a biology. You know that because you know who's old and who's young. Uh, but but the fact that aging can be targeted and, and aging can be delayed, aging can be reversed in several uh, places uh, in, in certain conditions is really, really important. Uh, we want to increase the health span and resiliency of, of the elderly and we can do it now and we should do it as fast as possible. So this is really the message. And what I'll do now, I'll use several uh, slides just to um, tell you where my expertise lie and where my experience lies so that you can ask me questions that are relevant to me. If you ask me questions out of my expertise, I will make sure that I'll tell you it's not my expertise, but that's what I hear. And I want to start with this photo that was taken of four siblings in the beginning of the last century. Those are four kids that were born between 1910 and 1920 in New York City. And what's really important about those four siblings is they all passed the age of 102. The big sister here died at 110. She died at 102, 107, and 109. It, and we've, we've accumulated over 750 centenarians like that and their families in order to discover longevity genes. And if you want to look some of the progress, we had a nature paper just, just uh, now published to talk about them. But I'm showing it for a different reason. And we can discuss the genes, but I, I'm showing it for a different reason. The question is, do they get sick when we all get sick, those centenarians, and all we have them is living longer uh, with sickness, or is their health span and lifespan goes together? I mean, if they live 200, we want them to live healthier. If this is what's going to happen, we want to see if there's a actually a population that does it. And the answer is, sorry, I have to uh, accept here something on my... Uh, uh, computer. <laughs> uh, so you, you see me, right? You see it, uh, Samantha? So this is, this is our centenarians that are living uh, longer. And I, I somehow lost my ability to, uh, let me see. Okay. Um, so the, the, in the green, you can see, I just lost my uh, uh, cursor. Never mind. Um, you can see that the people who don't have longevity in their family, they get sick, you know, half of them are sick by the time they are 60 and only 10% are sick when they're 80. This is in the green line. So this is a, a survival for, a, for diseases, okay? They're all alive. The, you see that the centenarians get sick much later and, and actually 20, 30 years later. And even at age 100, 30% of them don't have any disease. They will die one day. Uh, but this is not the important point I want to make. It's not only that they live healthier, but they have compression of morbidity. In other words, they die, uh, they, they die after weeks or months of being sick rather than us 
that carry diseases for five to eight years at the end of our life, okay? So there is an example that it can happen. The second point I wanna say is that we are lucky in the sense that we've done so much research that we agree on the biological hallmarks of aging. And I'm not going to discuss them in my opening statement, but I, I would love to go back to them. And in order to be a hallmark, you have to show that this is changing with aging and that if you fix it, you get an improvement in health span in animals and lifespan. Um, and so all those have been done. And it's very important because uh, the bioscience, the, the biotech industry is leading, uh, part of the wave is because of them. They are into this game. And each biotech is attacking one of the hallmarks. But the thing is, if you deal with one of the hallmarks, as you see the lines in between, you're improving others, okay? If you uh, do something with proteostasis, you're going to have effect on, on mitochondria, on inflammation, and on metabolism. You don't have to do everything in order to get uh, advanced. And, you know, in short, health span, okay, not only lifespan, but health span has been extended in numerous models. And some of those gerotherapeutics, I'm a geroscientist and I wanted to have gerotherapeutics up. Gerotherapeutics are drugs that will prevent age-related disease. They have been used in human and metformin and rapamycin are an example. I'll just make a case for uh, metformin because metformin does act on all the hallmarks of aging. Metformin has been used for over 70 years and it's safe. It was used initially to prevent flu and malaria and inflammation. And that's when it was discovered that it also lowers glucose in diabetes. And so it's not really, it didn't start as an anti-diabetic drug and it's not only an anti-diabetic drug. It's generic and cheap. It's the cheapest drug in the formula, in the US formulary. And there are studies that have shown, clinical studies that have shown that uh, metformin prevents diabetes, cardiovascular disease, uh, MCI and Alzheimer, and mortality. Um, and, can, and the cancer is association study, but there are 200 different studies that shows that people on metformin have 30% less cancer, all kinds of cancer. So... Uh, with this in mind, uh, we, the leaders of GeroScience, have gone to the FDA and suggested that we do a trial that's called TAME, because we want to tame aging. Uh, it's targeting aging with metformin, and we're going to use uh, metformin as a tool to show the FDA that aging can be prevented, or that really the diseases of aging can be prevented. Uh, let me skip that. And the uh, study is going to have 3,000 people um, that are going to do a placebo control. And the primary outcome is time until major uh, events. So what I'm telling you is that we're going to take people that we don't care what they have. And we don't care. We are agnostic to what disease they're going to have. Because as Eric Verdin showed you, aging is the major risk for all diseases. So, so if you have a mother who had diabetes and you're obese, you'll get diabetes next. We don't care because for us, it's all about aging. And we're just going to, to change those diseases. And by doing that, we are going to get an indication to treat, um, to prevent aging. And by doing that, we're going to have template because we need to do more than one tame study. Um, so I'll just end up by saying that we have bigger plans in the future and just leave you with the thought that you can take a sperm of 70 year old person and fertilize the egg of a 50 year old woman. We can, we can measure the age of the sperm and egg. But the point is when the babies form, when this blastocyte is formed, aging is erased. We don't have a memory of aging. So we have a condition where we know how to do it now we're trying to translate it. So maybe in the future, a 20-year-old will get a treatment to erase aging and never get old, okay? Also, I want to say that 
it's not only about aging, it's about people who survive cancer that are aging rapidly because we treat them with chemotherapy and radiation, right? People with HIV, they, they get diseases 10 years earlier. People with, um, who are uh, on wheelchair are aging fast. And if we're going to go to Mars, we have to stop aging because otherwise we'll get there with age-related disease and we'll never make it back. So the, these are the things that I wanted as a provocation. And now I'm going back to, uh, to you guys and, um, and we'll open it for uh, questions. So thank you. And um, to anyone who wants to ask a question, feel free to either send it in the chat or you can um, turn on your microphone and your camera in and ask Dr. Barzilai directly. Or, or I'm going to ask you questions. Uh, Pingua, wh why, are, why have you joined this session? M maybe, maybe I'm in the wrong session. Maybe you're in the wrong session. Wh why did you join this session? Oh, this is the right session for me, actually. Um, I, I was about to ask a question. Go ahead. So you're talking about your plan for uh, clinical trials. Actually, we have, uh, we have some compounds that are mouse model a significant extended lifespan. So I was thinking about how to do it because I know it's very expensive. I mean, in my position, I have trouble to find enough resource. So for your case, uh, I mean, that's gonna be a long time, right? Those experiments. Well, the TAME trial is designed, the funding is designed for six years, the power, uh, with the power that we have, we might add uh, four years, but, no matter how much time we're talking about, um, if you have a compound that you have to develop, uh, the indication will be there for you by the time you are ready for a clinical trial, okay? And the clinical, so I'm, I'm in a biotech, I'm founder of two biotechs and, and uh, you know, biotechs take a while and what biotechs need to do anyhow is to find an indication for a disease until we, have, until we have an indication for aging, you have to have a proof of concept for a disease. And that's the way we have to do. A lot of the compounds out there, a lot of the biotech have an idea of how to get them into market uh, to make some money so you can further develop it as a gerotherapeutic. Um, Susan, you uh, opened your screen. I, I wonder if you wanna ask some, some, something. Susan March. Anybody else? Uh, Pingua, um, there, there's also, of course, the issue of whether something that you find in mice will work in humans. Um, I, I just mentioned our last nature paper, but the, mm -hmm. the, the important part of that is that the longevity genes that we find you know, the, the difference in the genotype that we find between centenarians and control are targeting the same pathways that, that, that led us to our knowledge, mTOR and insulin IGF signaling and FOXO and things like that. So, so that unlike other diseases, our animal model is pretty good. Yeah, I get to uh, send you some information to see whether we can get some help from you. Yeah, we, uh, uh, based on what we have now, it is on the IIS pathway, but it's because I'm a chemist, you know, and those are kind of too far for me. I, I definitely need some help. T terrific. Uh, Dr. Lai, I, I, you're the last one to join. Can I answer any question for you? Well, uh, um, Dr. Lai thinks about that, Dr. Barzilai. There are a couple of questions in the chat. Oh. So um, Dr. Ho has asked, may, may I ask how you're defining event in your trial? Are they onset of metabolic diseases, infectious disease, chronic conditions only? Are there any secondary yeah. endpoints yeah. that may reflect frailty? 
Yeah, great question. That's why I was a little vague because I wanted people to ask me to clarify. So, so I, I, I kind of made the point that we have good preliminary data on um, several diseases. So what we're going to look, we're going to look at several of the cardiovascular outcomes. We're going to look at any kind of cancer except skin cancer. Uh, we're going to look at MCI and Alzheimer's, and we're going to look at mortality. Those are uh, the endpoints that we have, and it's a cluster, okay? So, you know, if you get any one of those diseases in the next period of time, this is an outcome for you. And, uh, and we hope that the group on metformin, just like in every other clinical study will move the outcomes uh, away. So those are hard outcomes uh, because the FDA doesn't necessarily buy the fact that aging can be prevented, but they're absolutely open the idea that maybe there's a drug that can prevent many age-related diseases. And, and that's why we designed the study the way we did with consultation of the FDA. I would also tell you some, uh, something kind of interesting that diabetes was also part of our outcomes and the FDA didn't like diabetes. And by the way, I'm a diabetologist. I'm seeing patients several times a month as a diabetologist. And I was, I was like taken back. But the FDA view is that diabetes is a chemical indication and most of the uh, and 40% only of the diabetic patients will have some complication 10 years down their line. For them, it's not an outcome that is hard outcome, like having a stroke, having a heart attack, having a cancer, okay, or dying. <laughs> so so that, that's, that's how we got to the cluster of disease that, that we got. Uh, thank you for asking that. Um, there's a question from Wenshaw Pong. Um, Wenshaw Ping, sorry. Uh, Javier Mendez has, Menendez has shown that metformin target KDM6A directly, and Jackie Han with Ann Burnett shown that KDM6A knockout increased lifespan. What's your opinion on that? Um, he's looking at, she's looking at study to study the effect of metformin through KDM6A on lifespan. So not, not knowing who all of you are, I'll, I'll, I'll be more generic, okay? I showed you that metformin targets all the hallmarks of aging. Really? Really? We, we, have, we have one drug that happens to do nine different things? Well, this is how it works. And this is why the hallmarks are connected. Metformin does something that takes your old cell or old organ or your body and make it younger. When your body becomes younger, lots of things are being corrected. And part of the reason that a lot of the gerotherapeutics that we know, like the sirtuins, or rapamycin, they're doing many things. And we kind of argue what is the most important thing, but we have got used to the fact that gerotherapeutics are going to have a lot of effect because no matter where they start, they're going to make us younger and therefore a lot of things are going to be corrected, okay? By the way, Jackie Han and Anne Brunette are great uh, investigators. Okay, we have uh, from Alfata. We have uh, several proof uh, for metformin and rapamycin that prevent aging. Why FDA yet not approving? How long it takes <laughs> to get uh, like anti-aging? So that's a good question. And I, I, there's a lot of provocation there. You might not realize, um, but uh, first of all, you know, um, anti-aging anti -aging is our enemies, okay? We are geroscientists. We do gero, uh, we want to do gerotherapeutics. We're talking about geroprotection, like special diets or exercise. So please uh, call it gerotherapeutic when you're asking that. So 
that we distinct ourselves between legitimate science and science that may be legitimate, but we don't know, may be dangerous also. So that, that's a, a, just a point of a, of a thing. Now, look, the FDA, um, so, so I, I always say that when, when we go to medical school, the first thing we learn, first day, is do no harm, right? They make us conservative immediately. Uh, the second day, uh, they say there's no never nor always in medicine. So you also become unsure of yourself. And I'm, I'm always kidding and saying that people in the FDA went to only those two days in medical school. So it's so hard with them. Look, look what happened. Five billion people were vaccinated against COVID and it still was experimental until recently, okay? So the point is we have to work with them. Now, what we have with metformin, we had huge safety data. We have experiments. All the study that we're doing has been done in isolated studies <laughs> around the world, okay? They're, they don't wanna take risks. They are suspicious anyhow. And, and they're suspicious, although we came to them as scientists, there was no pharmaceutical involved here, okay? Rapamycin at the FDA is considered not safe. Is it truly unsafe? Can we not use it safely? I, I don't think so, but, but that's how it's going to do. And it's going to do only by clinical study, unfortunately. Okay, but we have to do it because if we start just treating metformin and rapamycin, we're becoming the anti-aging 201 and still people won't believe us. We need to use this wave in order to get to get there, to get to our goal, to make sure that everybody knows that aging can be targeted and there are more than one drug that could, that could do that. So, so thank you for, um, for, the, for, for this question. And I hope I answered every word, metformin and rapamycin, FDA and anti-aging. <laughs> so uh, Vijay Kumar, is asking, is the TAME trial showing preliminary positive result? Well, the TAME study uh, was supposed to start before COVID. Thanks God it didn't start with, before COVID. And we can start that only when COVID is gone, unfortunately. So we had a major uh, delay and we're just trying to roll for, with the punches. I would tell you that there are nine studies now across the world that showed that people on metformin had less hospitalization from COVID and much less mortality. Basically third of the mortality of people who are not on, on metformin. Uh, so we have additional uh, proof that metformin is really a good gerotherapeutics and prevents deaths of aging and diseased. Hello, 5J-A-E-H, question mark, 5H. <laughs> um, so I, uh, so I, I, wanna, I wanna say something about uh, longevity genes. Um, and then I'll talk about NMN. So um, it, it's really interesting that almost 60% of our centenarians have some impairment in the pathway of growth hormone. Okay, so it's not only growth hormone, it's growth hormone IGF. There's a lot of things that are involved in the regulation of growth. And basically it's so interesting because we know from animals, you know, we know that the small dogs live longer than the large dogs. We know that ponies live longer than horses. We know that whenever we find a dwarf model or make a dwarf model, they live longer. It's in nature, okay? Um, and so it's kind of surprising to have seen that this, has, this is the, the most uh, prevalent longevity gene, the, the longevity pathway in, in our uh, centenarians. So why is it? You know, we have a, a theory in aging that's called the antagonistic pleiotrophy theory, that, that uh, 
things that are important for uh, evolution, for reproduction, can actually turn against you when you age. You know, we know that cholesterol is very important. It's, it's, it builds every cell, it builds our gonads, you know, it's very important. But if we have high turnover of cholesterol, uh, when we're old, then, then we get heart attacks, right? So it's antagonistic. So growth hormone is very important for our development and eventually for our reproduction. Okay, but then after that, after we reproduce, we're going into aging. And as Eric Verdon said, it's the balance between breakthrough, breakdowns and repair. That's the biology of aging. So it makes no sense to try and grow and, and use growth hormone and take the energy to growth when actually the energy has to go down now to repair. Okay, so that's another antagonistic pleiotrophy. And we've, in the lab, actually treated old mice with uh, antibodies against the receptor of IGF and showed that it increased health span dramatically, but also lifespan. So, um, so those are things to consider. About NMN. Um, uh, so look, there's no evidence that NMN is doing anything from human in a clinical trial. It's actually really, really hard to understand because there's a lot of lab that have used this NAD precursor, right? We, we, we want to have more NAD because that's where our energy will come from and, and, and it goes down. The NAD goes in, in tissues, go down with aging. And so it makes sense that we want to give those precursor and people who use the precursor have showed really nice data in animals. But uh, we have no, uh, no data to show that actually NAD was replenished. In fact, we have no idea that this NAD is absorbed through our intestines. Uh, there's no data or, there, there, or, or the stability of all those products is not that great. And if you don't put it in the freezer from the moment it came on, it might lose its effectiveness. And also there are lots of companies and you don't know what they're doing. I'm told that the best company is in Japan and it's $900 uh, per month. But, but mainly, I go back, mainly there's lots of issue that we don't understand in the biology with the supplement, but, but certainly they're not clinical data in humans. So is it going to harm you? No. Is it going to uh, uh, do anything? We really don't know. That's the state of the art of NMN now. I would say that there are lots of clinical trials that are happening, but we don't know what's going on yet. Okay, um, there is another question on the bio on the on biomarkers. So look, biomarkers are so important. The, the FDA was always wanted biomarkers because the FDA said, you know, if we take a blood test at 50, okay, and the blood test shows that you're actually biologically 40, then you don't need to do colonoscopy or you don't need to do breast, uh, uh, you know, ex, uh, uh, to, to, to breast exam. Um, and, and if you're 60, oh God, you need now all the prevention that's possible. So to distinct between biological age and chronologic age is absolutely important. And the best methods have been those epigenetic methods. It's, it's uh, looking at some methylation that's going out, uh, going on in your blood cells or any other cells. And they are very good biomarkers, but we want something else from biomarkers. We want to see if biomarker changes when we give a gerotherapeutics. And we don't have a good handle on that. So let me tell you what's my favorite biomarker. We published in Nature Medicine and in Aging Cells several papers. We looked at uh, 5,000 proteins in 1,000 of people between the ages 65 and 95. And we asked, what's What's going up or down between 65 and 95? And it's kind of an interesting story, but what I wanted to tell you that what was immediately relevant and annoyed me 
first was there's lots of breakdown. There was a breakdown of platelets and of collagen and extracellular materials and other things. I said, I, I'm not learning f uh, in nothing from that until I realized that, you know, maybe that's the best mark, uh, markers because no matter how we treat aging and we can tr treat it in several ways, at the end, we want to prevent the breakdown. And if we can in six weeks or six months show that the drug prevents the, break, the breakdown, then we can do a big phase, phase uh, uh, trial. Um, so so that, that's the two cents about uh, biomarkers. Uh, in, it's in development. Uh, there's lots of problems as it is. There's a lot of problems, uh, reproducibility. Uh, there's an argument. Um, it's not always linked to mechanism. We're trying to look into mechanism. Um, so the biomarkers are developed not only in epigenetics, but also in proteomic and metabolomic, and we'll probably have a better handle on that. By the way, part of TAME design was to really establish the biomarkers for uh, gerotherapeutics too. Okay, uh, Jen is asking, would the goal uh, be to have lower levels of IGF-1? If so, does the, the metformin impact this? So it happens that metformin lowers IGF-1, but um, it's not lowering the IGF, lowering the IGF level is one way to do it, but it's really blocking the effect of IGF. So what we have done, um, Amgen and other pharmaceuticals have developed an IGF receptor antibody to treat cancer. And there's lots of clinical trials that fail because as you know, cancer is much more smarter than us. And, and, but they developed this drug. This drug you give once a week. And we murinized this drug and took it to our animals and took older animal, like 22 months old animal that is like 60, 70 years old. And when we gave it to them, it extended many parameters of their health span and also 10% increase in the lifespan, although we started it at such an old age. I would tell you also our centenarians, okay, when we take our centenarians and look at those with the lower half of IGF-1 level and the higher half of IGF level, those with the lower half of IGF-1 level live twice as long, okay, they are already centenarians, but they live twice as long as those with the higher IGF-1 level. So we're pretty sure that this is really important and really important to aging. And there are 50 ways to live your lover. You can do many things in order to uh, target uh, uh, IGF-1. Um, uh, well, somebody, uh, somebody asked, I think I answered that already. What, what are some of the biomarkers that are planned to track the TAME trial? So we're going to do all the biomarkers. <laughs> um, uh, we have specific that we know works for metformin, but we're going to do the whole panel. Actually, the, NI, the NIH is paying for that part of taking and looking at all those uh, biomarkers and then seeing which combination is the best predictive. And maybe we'll have just a cluster of them that will be uh, very good. What um, uh, uh, Alfata again, um, what would be the good time to start metformin if it approved as anti-aging? Uh, you mean gerotherapeutic. Uh, whether diabetes patient taking metformin will have longer lifespan. Uh, let me then show you, let me show you back. I'll, I'll go back to uh, this, the slide that I skipped because I think it's important. Just a minute, I'll have to do it differently. I'll have to go here. So, sorry, not here. Uh, okay. This is, this will answer your question. So this is a study that included 200,000 patients. 
that was done almost, that was done in the UK. And they took four groups. They took people who were prescribed metformin or sulfonylurea. So those are both diabetic patients and people who are totally matched to them, same doctor, same age, same everything, but do not have diabetes. So let, let's look at this is, this is sulfonylurea and they, they looked at mortality, five years mortality. So you see that mortality here in the sulfonylurea group, that's a people who are treated, diabetics that are treated with this drug uh, versus the red group, they had twice as high mortality. We know people with diabetes die twice as much almost as other people. But then look what happens on the people who are metformin compared to the red, red uh, to the uh, black line, which are people who are not on metformin. People on metformin who are diabetics had less mortality than people without diabetes, okay? Significantly less, 17% less. Now, the people on metformin had diabetes, were more obese, and had more diseases to start with, and yet had lower mortality. So this is how strong is, um, uh, this is how strong is diabetes, um, the effect of metformin on, on, on lifespan. Um, now you're asking when, when to take it. Um, and my answer is that I don't know. I don't know. And not only that, TAME is not going to resolve it. Most of the studies that I told you that have been done were in people over the age of 50. And I would say that makes sense probably. Uh, you know, unless you're obese, you should start it even before because obesity uh, accelerates aging. But, uh, you know, I don't know the answer because we're starting at age 65 to 80. And I think this is true for all the drugs that we're getting out there. You know, if we talk about senolytics, that are killing senescent cells. Well, senescent cells accumulate in older age. You don't want to start it when you're 20, 30, 40, or, or, or probably 50. It's better for 70 or 80. So we don't know the exact time for everything. That's the secondary thing that we'll do. Uh, but there's definitely evidence that from diabetes, at least, that uh, the protection of metformin is, uh, is uh, earlier on. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, do you, Samantha, do you see a, any other question? No other questions in the chat at the moment. But one question I had for you was um, you just talked about older aging versus younger aging and trying to get a sense as to what makes sense globally, recognizing that there are populations that are living longer in different continents and in a lot of the global south people aren't going to be getting to 80 right now. And so what does that look like from your perspective? Okay, so first of all, this is not my expertise. So I'll answer just things that, that I know. Yeah, but population is getting older all over the world, but, but uh, the life expectancy all over the world is still very varied, okay? It's the highest in Japan and Singapore and Israel. And then it gets lower. Uh, America is, I think, number 36 in longevity or something like that, but, uh, but uh, it gets. And, and the, the, the feeling, what we're saying is that um, 80, uh, 80 is the new 60, okay, in the Western world. I, I mean, when I'm thinking of my grandfather who was my age when he died, he looked so much older than me, okay? He looked like what I would look in 20 years, probably, hope not. <laughs> uh, so the, the, the biological age has, has seemed to shift because of all the medical intervention and preventions that we've been uh, doing. There's less, less attrition in the body and it's still going, even if aging, uh, if life expectancy goes out, this effect is going to lag behind. And I think really what I'm saying is that the biomarkers of aging are going to be global in my mind. And they're going to, and you're going to discover that different countries have different set points for their uh, mean biological age. 
and we'll be able to use it in order to plan strategies more effective. You know, maybe in this countries, you'll have to take metformin when you're 40 years old and not when you're over 50 years old. Uh, is there anything else that you can milk me on that? <laughs> oh, you said something about um, also zones. So, you know, there are the blue zones and there's nothing wrong with the concept, okay, of blue zones, that if you have the right nutrition and the, the right society, and if you're uh, happy and all that, that you live longer, there's obviously this is work, this is working, that, that for exceptional longevity in the blue zone, you also need genetics, okay? Still in the blue zone, some people are, are dying at 80 and uh, very few are dying at 100, even if it's more than usual. But, you know, if you're, if you're getting, if your society is more healthy, then you get more in upper ages, right? That's, uh, that's what's going to happen. But I think that blue zone environment is very, very important. But if we want to, you look, our life expectancy is about 115 as a human species, okay? That, that doesn't mean that we won't break it in, in the future. But we're dying in most of the world before the age of 80, you know, and in a lot of the world, much less than 80. So we have at least 35 years that we have to somehow manage, that we should manage without even being too drastic. And, and this is our goal. And believe me, every health span increase of a year or two or three, like with metformin, is going to provide a lot, a lot for people who are being healthy or having good quality of life and who are contr contracting their morbidity. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, we've got, and is that Dr. Oh, Hello. Uh, uh, Alfata, nice seeing you. I, I cannot hear you though. We cannot hear you. Maybe write down what you want to say, but we cannot hear you. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I, I think we're, we're about time. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for their question. I hope you're part of our team. I, I hope you know aging can be targeted. We should do it. It's, it's for a much better world. Uh, we need the elderly to sustain climate change and epidemics too, okay? <laughs> Let's fight. Let's find solution for, for aging. Let's do geroscience and have gerotherapeutics. Thanks, thanks so, so much, much for your time and for sharing all of that knowledge with us. And for everyone else, if you go back to the summit page to go um, to the next set of breakout rooms, um, we will see you there. So thanks again, Dr. Barzilai. Thank you.